Welcome to Bread and Roses, a weekly political social magazine broadcast via New Channel TV. I'm Mariam Namazi and I'm presenting today's program with my co-hosts. Bahram Sirush. Welcome. In this week's program, we're going to be speaking on the issue of Islamic law or what's known as Sharia law. And as we all know, Sharia is in the news every day. Uh, recently, the Sultan of Brunei has uh, brought stoning to the country. We have the case of Raif Badawi in uh, Saudi Arabia, who has been sentenced to 10 years imprisonment and a thousand lashes. Is it possible for anyone to survive thousand lashes uh, for insulting Islam? You've got this Iranian uh, British woman, Roya Nobacht, who went to Iran and has been in prison for many months now, also for insulting Islamic sanctities. And the case goes on and on and on. So the thing that we need to discuss today is Sharia law. Um, you know, it, it's interesting because you often hear people saying that this is not about religion, it's not about Islam, it's about culture. And if you just tweak it a little bit and you interpret it differently, it's going to be fantastically fair and just. If you want the short answer, the answer is that it can never be just or fair. But the longer answer is what we're going to discuss here and we'll have an interview for our viewers as well. So let's just jump into the conversation. Can Sharia law ever be just or fair? Well, first we have to know what Sharia is. Sharia is something which, uh, imagine some uh, you've got a box and uh, 1400 years ago, you put it in that box and seal it, and then you bring it to the 21st century and you open it. What, you know, what mess, uh, how it would smell, you know. It's something bad, which belongs, very bad. Very bad. It, something which belongs, you know, to not even the uh, uh, Middle Ages, even before that, and to try to bring it. So, bring it to 21st century. So, even the question is, uh, in, in a sense, wrong. How can you uh, get uh, ad adapt, you know, something which has nothing to do, you know, uh, with the beliefs, with what humanity has achieved so far, and try to adapt it to the present day? It's obvious it will only lead to catastrophe and brutality and barbarism. Well, actually, I think it has two aspects. One is um, um, Sharia law on itself as a philosophy, as a code, as a set of uh, rules and regulation and uh, sets of sort of um, limits for behavior. When you look at it in itself, it's very reactionary, very backward. It do, is not compatible with, with 21st century. Every aspect of it, when you look at from from child custody to marriage, from inheritance, from uh, rules and regulation and limits the behavior of uh, um, um, individuals and community and families and regulates that, it's very reactionary in itself when you look at it. We have to also look at it in the context of the modern times. The, we have to see that today Sharia law used by states and political groups and you, you know is used by dictatorship. It's a new form of dictatorship, it's a new banner that the dictatorship has picked up, readily available to restrict the citizens' right as a reactionary force. Yeah, I mean, I think that's an important point. It does have to do with Islam. I mean, that's the first point I want to say, is that for people who are making excuses and saying that Sharia wouldn't be this bad if real Islam was practiced, I, I would say that's impossible. I mean, a lot, everything in, in Sharia law is found in the Qur'an, it's found in the Hadith, the Sunnah, and the sayings and practices of Muhammad, Islam's prophet. So, and, and that's the case for any religion. Christianity, we know what havoc Christianity wreaked, what a bleak world it brought with its inquisitions and its crusades. And Islam is doing that today. And so I think, you know, the, the issue is that it, you know, it, it always surprises me that there are people who say, well, it's just a matter of interpretation. How can you interpret something that is so reactionary into something positive? It's impossible. Stop making excuses for it. It's a very different matter. If you believe in these things, fine. You have a right to believe in them. And what the reality is that people living in the 21st century will often pick and choose and adapt it to meet 21st century life. But to have it as part of the state, to have it as part of the law, as you say, it's not a matter of religion alone, it's a matter of politics and political power. 
Yeah. I, th I think what the, the people actually, uh, they said different in their position, they want to uh, ignore the reality that exists and how it's been used as well. They want to actually pull the discussion on, on, on the philosophy, on the rules and regulations in, in an abstract format. Even in an abstract format, when you look at it, how could the uh, uh, child custody in an abstract format be just? It's unjust. How, how um, could the rules of uh, regulation of inheritance, women uh, uh, receiving half of a man, or uh, uh, men actually owning women, uh, Women actually be submissive to, uh, to husband, the fathers and the brothers and the, and the male members of the family and the community. In, in a, in, e, even in its ab abstract format, uh, it, it's wrong, is unjustifiable. But the reality is that this uh, uh, Sharia law is being used as a political means as well. That's so we can't actually separate it from reality and its function. Mm -hmm. That's why Saudi Arabia is implementing it. That's the Sult Sultan of Brunei who is sitting on billions of dollars of oil uh, to control and, and you see that when the people start in Brunei to start questioning uh, the state of uh, 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 um, uh, the division within that society, you will see Sharia is, is law is implemented to control society. Okay, I, I mean, uh, we should also mention one of the most important countries in terms of population and its strategic place and that's Iran and especially in the Middle East. And imagine, um, it's quite right to look at the discussion in, at two fronts. One, as, as an ideology, a, a system of thought, and uh, compared to science, for example, to enlightenment, that can be criticized and, and uh, examined at that level. And the other issue, which then uh, contradicts uh, and uh, uh, clashes with the rights, uh, civil rights that people take as the norm in many societies, um, and then examine it at that level. Okay, so the first one can be a sort of academic issue uh, to even if it was confined uh, to, to the ideas of certain minorities, you know, in their private uh, thoughts or practices, um, you know, their expressions, they adored Sharia, okay. But even at that level, we can criticize as unscientific, backward, you know, compared to anything that we have achieved in science, in biology, everything that we know, take for granted. But the issue becomes uh, an issue of uh, people's lives and death, you know, uh, when it comes to politics. And if it wasn't for politics, uh, I think if I was quite right, if it wasn't for politics, then we wouldn't probably even be discussing this today. I mean, definitely. The, the, the thing is that you might have a neighbor who's misogynist or, you know, um, homophobic. Who cares? It, it doesn't affect, you, you don't get hung in a city square because your neighbor doesn't like it. The difference is when it's part of the law. And I think that's the problem with Sharia law. It's the law in many places. Especially in Iran. In, in Iran, for example, yeah. there are, um, you know, 130 offenses that are punishable by death. Heresy, blasphemy, apostasy, enmity against God, you name it, you know. And so if you look at real examples, you know, you've got uh, people whose hands and legs are being amputated for stealing. You know, it, what's interesting is that a lot of the punishments that are meted out are actually criminal. You know, it's, it, it's, it's the opposite under the Sharia law. The is punishment criminal. is criminal. The ruling elite is criminal. And very often the people who are being charged and murdered by the state are innocent because many of the uh, punishments are actually for things that are considered normal behavior and normal lifestyles for people. Being gay, being an atheist. Being a woman, you know, it's a crime to be many of these things under Sharia law. Or live in uh, Islam, live in Islam, uh, and the, as you, you are quite right in, in the sense that punishment itself. Like, imagine uh, if in in a European country, um, you said that uh, that you are allowed, the state is allowed to torture, which is torture, you know, uh, flogging, flogging is torture, or amputation. It's a gruesome, you know. Uh, uh, way of um, executing a, a form of punishment. So those who perpetrate it are the criminals in the first place. But those are part of the penal system. In Iran, for example, part of the judicial system prescribes all of these in um, uh, grotesque details, you know. Exactly, yeah. So the issue becomes uh, an important one for the people who are living under, un, under those laws. And um, if, as, you know, if it wasn't an issue that it is part of the legal system of those countries, then you could just um, take a sort of an academic discussion or a discussion at the level of 
enlightening people's well, ideas. I mean, what, what do you say to people who say that it's got nothing to do with the religion, it's cultural? Well, I think at, at, at the same time, we know it's, um, these, when we say cultural, we're talking about a state. That's what we're talking about. It's not, the Sharia law doesn't bubble from beneath. It doesn't come from people. People don't think, God, I, I need to treat my, uh, you know... Um, I need my, an amputation my, yeah, today. I, I, to yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> people, normally people don't, don't actually think these, this way. This is an organised way. Sharia law is an organised way, way of controlling society. And I think the most important thing is that to actually resolve the issue of Sharia law or confront it, educating people is not enough. You need to criticise it publicly, you need to debate it, you need to challenge it, but the reality is that it's very much linked to political power. So people who actually ignore the political aspect of Sharia law, they are mistaken, they can't confront it. That's why it, when you, you must have, uh, you must challenge uh, Sharia, and Sharia, Sharia forces politically, and you, it, the, the, the must be driven out of, you know, political sphere, and they shouldn't have any power to implement it. Well, I mean, this important. is what you often see in the West, though. It's often portrayed as a demand of Muslims and the Muslim minority or the Muslim world. And the reality is that nowhere is there a greater challenge against Sharia than in places that actually have Absolutely. to suffer it, yeah. in Iran. Yeah. There is a huge backlash. I mean, I was just we were just talking earlier about how the, the, the country that searches Richard Dawkins' name most is Iran, yes, you know, absolutely. and and that's the case for for many uh, countries under Islamic rule. The the thirst for a life, a secular and a modern life, is so great, and it's sort it's kind of offensive when you think about it that, you know, this sort of barbarity is seen to be people's right to religion and culture. How dare and that's that a, sort of that implication would, you know, be made? That's a you know that, that that's an upside down version of this. This is means of political political Islamic movement to implement Sharia or to re, to re, organize its forces in Europe to pacify people. He says this is demands of people. Actually, if you ask the whole of population of Iran, do you do you want to live under Sharia law or do you want to live in a secular? The state. The answer is definitely 99% is going to be the, they don't want Sharia. Yeah. You'll see that they actually the fighting Sharia and Sharia law and all of all of its implications in Iran on a daily basis. That's why the state is so brutal and it try to enforce it every day the harsher and harsher way of controlling. And you have police on the streets actually implement Sharia law. If it was the demands of the people, you don't need such great police force such and such di huge situation. dictatorship. The reason that you have such huge dictatorship, both in Saudi Arabia, Iran, Pakistan, everywhere that political, Islamic political forces are operating. Look at the Al-Qaeda forces everywhere. They actually do that with brute force in, in every, anywhere they step in. Uh -huh. Yeah, the um, issue, you know, confronting those uh, Islamists who are the pro proponents of these uh, perpetrators, in, in a sense it's easier to criticize them. The issue becomes harder when you've got a political and cultural elite in, in, in the West who, and that is changing as well, by the way, yeah, thanks to a lot of the campaigns that have been done. Um, but that sort of postmodernist view, the cultural relativist view, which has looked at the, anything outside Europe because of its post-colonial guilt, has looked at it as something uh, that deserves to be uh, uh, treated sensitively. And, and uh, so they have bunched everybody together in a country which they wouldn't do, for example, in England. You wouldn't say that everybody's the same. But they have done that in about countries. They say, oh, you've got Iran and everybody's the same. And they're all Muslim. And they've done it over the dead bodies of, of countless generations in the Middle East and North Africa. I want to so, just um, yeah. bring one issue um, because we're getting to the end of our discussion. One of our donors from the 61 people who donated to get our four beautiful cameras and tripods. Um, Terry um, Murray, he had a question because um, he, he's given us a suggestion of, some, of an issue to discuss and I want to ask you here about it. He wanted us to discuss the concept of ijtihad which is reasoning within Islam where people can reason and reach to a positive conclusion as a result and I think we should use the term reason very lightly when it comes to religion and reason uh, but is that a solution there are people from uh, who are Muslim activists who say that ijtihad and reasoning in a feminist in a reformist way is the way out of the situation that we see today would you well, agree I think or it, it, it doesn't doesn't equate to reason 
Reason is mean that you, you, there is an element of trial and error, and uh, you, you test something, it doesn't work. There is always self-criticism, and you accept the result of the criticism. Ishtihad doesn't mean that. Ishtihad means actually somebody who's studied Sharia law has the upper hand and his knowledge and his uh, um, uh, th their view. Uh, is dominant and needs to be ac accepted. Ishtar doesn't mean reasoning. Reasoning in itself is critical. So there's, you, you can't have Ishtahad in Sharia. Sharia law is a, a sealed and closed system. That's a dogma. Well. Exactly. Yeah. It's a closed system. If you wanted to reason and, and, and you question it, reason is related to questioning, changing and accepting the result of those criticism, then actually systematically you approach it. I'm going to have Sharia law is closed down. down. Sorry. Did yeah. you want to say one, two sentences only, please? Yeah, <laughs> because I think we should leave it to the to whoever wants to believe in Ijtihad or Islam. I think it's, it's not our concern. Do it. Go, yes, into go, go ahead and do as much Ijtihad as you want. Just don't do it in the state and the law because everyone's life is at stake. Let's now go to an interview that we did earlier with Pragna Patel, the director of South Hall Black Sisters. In the meanwhile, though, before you watch that, I want to remind you that you should consider this program yours. Information on how to contact us is on the screen. Contact us, yell at us, support us, tell us what you think, and we'll be sure to include your thoughts and your discussions in this program. Stay with us. Thank you so much for being on our program today. Thank you for I having me. I wanted to ask you about the issue of Sharia law. What's wrong with it, or any religious law for that matter? Well, religious laws are by their very nature um, supposed to be rooted in divine texts and divine law, which means that they're above regulation and a accountability, uh, above the state almost. And so, in a sense, the problem with uh, these laws is they're very discriminatory, they're very based in very discriminatory structures of, 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 of systems. Mm -hmm. And so, if, they are, if you can't hold them to account because they're above and outside of the state, then it means that very vulnerable subgroups in societies that have very little power in terms of the state and control over their lives are going to feel excluded, discriminated against, and treated as second-class citizens. Um, and worse, um, around the world, wherever religious laws have operated, whether in communities or as part of the state, they have discriminated against minorities and women in particular. And it is really important that we do not have, in the 21st century, uh, laws that allow this kind of hierarchical uh, structures to exist, which discriminate against half of the population. Mm. I mean, some will say, you have some Muslim feminists, they call themselves, for example, who say that this has nothing to do with religion, it has to do with culture. What's your take on that? My take on that is that actually, I think that's a very dangerous argument. C uh, religion is always mediated through cultural, social, economic processes. To try and abstract religion from the lived reality of people just seems to be absolutely nonsensical. And when you do that, as the religious right in a lot of the world um, uh, and in the communities here are doing, then what you're doing is basically constructing religious essentialism. And that means that there is a certain interpretation that will dominate. At the moment, for example, in the UK, what we're seeing is the religious right, religious fundamentalists, who dominate the discourse around religion in our communities and are the gatekeepers of interpretations of that religion in, insofar as the state institutions are concerned. And they argue that there is something that is called the essence. There is some religious values that is the essence of their religion. But actually, it is just their interpretation. And it is not necessarily the interpretation of many others, particularly those that they want to discriminate against. So I think that in culture and religion are enmeshed. To try and separate them is to try and abstract religion from the lived reality of people. 
and that means that basically you're trying to argue that there is some kind of authentic version out there Which that you can adhere to yeah. and it is extremely yeah. dangerous uh, apart from the fact that everybody's lived reality means that they interpret religion in a way that makes sense to them and what you're saying really i think is proof of what's wrong with this argument that if it's interpreted properly it'll be fine when well, it comes where, to religious where in law. the world has religion law religious laws ever been interpreted properly they've always been interpreted by groups who want to be in power and who want to control others and who have a world view that is very hierarchical and unequal essentially and it is although what we're seeing around the world is actually a move to the right and the uh, and the dominance of the religious right in all sorts of places and i'm not just talking about islam for example in india the rise of the hindu right all these groups who are in the ascendancy who are gaining power who are gaining power in state structures are actually wanting to implement their version of religion which is a very patriarchal it is a homophobic uh, anti rights agenda and that is what's wrong and i think that you know they do that by disavowing secular laws as if they are western i think it's really important to get away from this binary that there are religious laws and there are western laws what we need are good universal sets of laws rooted in universal human rights principles of equality of justice of fairness of non-discrimination if we don't have that then we actually are creating very dangerous societies for ourselves in which power and control by those who are greedy for that are going to a uh, lord over others i mean i think you make a real these really important distinctions which i think that a lot of people don't get there's a distinction between someone who's muslim or considered to be muslim because they could be atheist or secularist or free thinkers between and with islam as well as with islamism or mm. the the religious right and in a sense sometimes these are not seen as different so if you criticize islam or sharia the, the pro islamic muslim will say you're racist yeah. and the far right will say if you don't criticize muslims you're playing into yeah. the sharia agenda i think it's very interesting how the religious right have captured mm -hmm. identity politics mm -hmm. in a way that they've collapsed islamism muslim identity to mean islamism and what we have are the wider society also collapsing everything um what does it mean to be muslim you're muslim i know lots of people are muslim they have as many varied views of the world as any other but um the the islamic right the islamism is a political project these are people who use religion for political purposes so it's in their interest to construct a muslim identity that fits their world view but actually there are many many muslims who are opposing who are struggling around the world for their human rights they may be they may see themselves as kind of progressive as feminists as human rights activists uh, they may see themselves as atheists they may they see themselves as secularists by secularists not anti religion but anti the political use of religion so you know these are these are really important um divisions that we've got to understand that there is no unitary category called muslim it doesn't exist it is a creation of islamic political projects um and we must make a differentiation between a muslim identity which is varied which can be atheist secularist religious whatever and islamism which is essentially political project a right wing political project i mean it, i think that's a really crucial point especially because what you see is with this sort of identity politics all of class politics all of the social and progressive movements that are taking place in the middle east and north africa in communities right here in in the west are sort of erased yes. and it's just you know you just are either if you're a real proper muslim you've got to be an islamist yes and you've got to want sharia law and the burqa and and, and what not mm. i think that's absolutely right we are seeing the erasure of the diversity mm. within muslim populations mm. um and i say muslim populations not muslim community because the notion of community in the way that it's implied to my uh, applied to minorities in the UK very much homogenizes 
communities as if there's just one identity, not multiple. And so I think that erasure is occurring, but it's a very deliberate erasure. It is a deliberate erasure by the political right that are in the dominant positions and the state. The state also thinks it's a very colonial attitude to minorities where it wants to homogenize and see minorities as a collective where there are leaders that gatekeep for the community and represent the needs of the community. So what we're seeing, for example, in the UK is the state and uh, the religious right constructing identities for minorities, rather, which are absolutely removed from the lived reality of minorities. One last question. You mentioned universalism and secularism, and those seem to be important alternatives mm. to Sharia. Can you just explain? I think it's very important that we assert secularism. By secularism, I do not mean anti-religion. Uh, secularism are spaces where religious and non-religious people can live side by side but share a common value system that is important. And that value system, what we invest that value system in, with, is for me much more important than being hung up about secularism. It is about fairness and justice and equality. And for women, these are very critical issues around the world. Anywhere where religion is in control, women are not equal. They are highly discriminated against. They are treated as less than human beings. So the universal value system we share within secular spaces is what for me is important. Um, secularism doesn't mean anti-religion. It allows religion to flourish, but it allows those who don't wish to be religious to also flourish. But what binds us is our common humanity and that humanity must be rooted in universal values of human rights. That's why it's really important and I don't mind if there are Muslim feminists who want to call themselves Muslim feminists as long as what they're doing is making sure that they are supporting rather than opposing a secular um, a secular agenda which makes sure which which is the best hope we have of ensuring rights for everyone okay thank you very much Pragna thank you I hope you enjoyed that uh, interview I wanted to before the end of the program give a shout out to some of the 61 wonderful lovely kind people that bought us our gorgeous uh, cameras and tripods we'll show you pictures of that on the screen now uh, thank you to you, wonderful people. Some of you are Tanya Smith, Miriam Evans-Lewis, Mehran Sharmini, Leigh Raymond and Ben Finney, David Baird, Terry Murray, John Ricketts, Stephen and Sir Paul Lindsay, Chris Moose, and Diderik Zweger. I apologize if I said anything wrong, but you can mess up my name too anytime you want. Thank you. We love you for your support. We are now uh, organizing another fundraising campaign for £15,000 because our um, directors and uh, colleagues Reza Moradi and Pune Ravi want more things. They're just horribly greedy. They want a video mixer, they want a computer and they want better microphones. So we, we're going to show you the link to the uh, new fundraising campaign at the bottom of our screen as well. Um, don't forget to support us and contact us. I'm just going to give each of us one or two more sentences on this issue as a sum up. Think, uh, uh, Sharia in itself is wrong. Politically is oppressive. You look at any examples anywhere in the world, Iran, Pakistan, uh, Saudi Arabia, anywhere you'll see Sharia restricts people's life and is very oppressive. Um, just as we are not prepared to go back on our scientific achievements. Nobody would say, you know, get rid of all the science, medicine that we have achieved. We should not accept going back on our uh, cultural um, advances and, and advances in terms of uh, civil, civil rights and the rights of the people. Yes. Great. So I suppose the question is, how do you solve a problem like Sharia? You don't. You get rid of it. Sharia has no place in the 21st century. It has no place in a modern society. It belongs in the dustbins of history. And it is people in Iran, people in countries in the Middle East and North Africa that are challenging this movement head on and that will bring this movement to an end. Until then, we'll see you next week. Goodbye.